Well, hello and welcome to our eighth Pensions Lawcast. And today's exciting topic is pensions litigation. Uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be cramming in as much useful and topical information on pensions litigation uh, as we can. Looking at what we're going to cover, we're going to look at the types of pension claims. Uh, me and my fellow CMS partner, Tim Green, are going to be looking at part seven and part eight claims. And then another litigation partner, Neil Gibson, is going to be looking at trends in litigation and the general direction of travel with pensions litigation. And finally, we're delighted to have Roxana Pierce from US firm Robbins Geller, who's going to talk us through uh, matters from a US perspective, in particular, class action, which perhaps is a foretaste of things to come here in the UK. So just a basic introduction to uh, pensions litigation. The range and nature of pensions disputes is vast. And if you're involved in pensions, whether as a trustee, an advisor or a pensions manager, you'll be very fortunate if you haven't come across con contentious pensions matters uh, so far. Um, and just as the nature of pensions disputes is very wide, so there are a large number of forums to resolve those disputes. For example, uh, member disputes will invariably go to the pensions ombudsman or the FCA, whereas more significant disputes, which is what we're going to be focused on, tend to go to the Chancery Division of the High Court. I think it's fair to say that claims are on the increase. Certainly, the pensions ombudsman has seen a huge increase in his workload, but I think it's also true of the Part 7 and Part 8 claims as well. Uh, many of the Part 7 claims never actually go to court. The vast majority are settled before they get there for a number of reasons, not least because of the cost of litigation, but also because of reputational reasons. But I think in the current times, current times of economic distress, where there are insolvent employers, there are likely to be more of these type of claims. You know, with DB, DB schemes where there isn't a solvent employer to bail out uh, losses to the scheme, the trustees are almost duty bound to take action to recover losses where there have been breaches of contract or negligence. So I think we're likely to see an increase in claims. Litigation, uh, as many of you know, is a bit of a, a minefield. Um, there are lots of elephant traps to trip you up if you're not familiar with procedural rules, and we'll be getting on to some of those in due course. Now, the two types of high court claims that we see are known as Part 7 and Part 8 claims. Now, there are numerous procedural differences between those type of claims, but perhaps the easiest way to describe them is that Part 7 claims are what might you call contentious litigation. These are professional negligence actions, typically negligence actions against actuaries, accountants, auditors, even lawyers occasionally. Um, whereas Part 8 is often seen as non-contentious litigation. Now, Part 8 is where you go to court uh, to get directions of the court, whether directions for construction or to seek rectification uh, of uh, scheme documents. Now, I say it's often seen as being uh, non-contentious, but often the amounts involved in Part 8 claims are significant, often hundreds of millions of pounds. So actually, they do get pretty contentious. And I'm going to ask Tim Green to take you through the Part 8 process. Thanks, Neil. I, I'm going to talk about the Part 8 court applications and what they are, when they might be necessary, and what the process is for, for actually making the application. Part 8 refers to Part 8 of the Civil Procedure Rules, and it's a process available for claims where there's no substantial dispute of fact. If there is a substantial dispute of fact, as you've just mentioned, Part 7 is the correct forum for the claim. I tend to refer to them as non-contentious litigation, as you have, and the process is intended to be simpler there's no need for particulars of claim, there's no need for a defence, and there's no allocation questionnaire. The process is evidence-based and the parties present that evidence exhibited to witness statements. Part 64 of the Civil Procedure Rules confirms that claims that affect the administration of estates and trusts must be brought under Part 8 of the Civil Procedure Rules. So trust-based pension schemes that have these issues that need to go to court for direction 
should use the Part 8 process. The types of claims are construction or interpretation claims where you have ambiguity in rules or there's a misunderstanding. Many of these schemes have been in operation for a long time and the law is technical and always evolving in this area. And sometimes the divergence between practice and what was intended, it doesn't match with the trustee and rules. And so if there's uncertainty, the trustees need to go to the court to gain certainty. Other types of claims could be how to exercise their powers in relation to the trustee and rules. Again, if there's uncertainty, the trustees want to get the certainty so that they know they're administering the scheme properly. Trustees are under a fiduciary duty to act in members' best interests, which means they must pay the correct benefits to the members. If they knowingly act in breach of trust, they're potentially held to be personally liable. And that's obviously a place that trustees don't want to get to. And hence, there is this forum where they can go to court to get directions on how they should administer the scheme. The parties to the claim are typically the trustees, the sponsoring employer or employers, and representative beneficiaries. So the representative beneficiary acts for, the, uh, for a category of beneficiary within the scheme who've got an interest in the proceedings. Typically, what happens is the trustees or the sponsoring employer will bring the claim and they'll present the issues to the court. So, for example, if there's uncertainty surrounding the equalisation date for a scheme, the trustees will present the issues and the uncertainty to the court. They often take a neutral approach in this. The defendants, on the other hand, will present the evidence that supports their interests. And for a sponsoring employer, for the example of an equalisation date, they will often look to have the earliest equalisation date. That's because it's the least costly option for them whereas the representative beneficiaries would look to have the later equalisation date because it's in the interest of the membership because they'll get a bigger benefit. Now, when a court is, is approached under part eight, the application will ask for a representation order that binds all the members of the scheme. And the reason it does that is not just because it would be unwieldy to have all the members of the scheme as a party, but also there may be unknown beneficiaries, so for example, contingent beneficiaries. The representation order then will bind everyone and the, and the trustee knows that they can rely on the court order without there being a risk of a further claim from a disgruntled member. Now it is possible to have non-member representatives, that might be the case if no one volunteers, but it also might be the case if the uh, claim is particularly complex, you could have a solicitor representative beneficiary. And sometimes the legal teams present the arguments for a, a theoretical beneficiary. The costs in relation to Part 8 claims are typically borne by the scheme. Now that's, that's okay so long as it's a reasonably and properly incurred cost or the amount is reasonable and proportionate. And if there are cost agreements with parties with the interest in the claim, there will be no need for a cost order. Now, sometimes there can be uncertainty either at the beginning or throughout uh, the process of a, a Part 8 application as to whether the costs are reasonable and properly incurred. And the trustees have a mechanism where they can make another application to the court to seek BEDO relief. And if they are granted BEDO relief, this will protect them against future actions that they will take in relation to the claim. So it protects them to begin proceedings, continue proceedings and defend proceedings. The final points that I wanted to mention were in relation to summary disposal of part eight claims. If the parties agree what the issues are and they agree the resolution to the issue as they're going through the part eight process, then they can approach the court with that agreement or a compromise for the court's blessing. And if they get that blessing, the trustees know that they can act in confidence in how they administer the scheme if the court gives the relief they've been sought. The other point that I'd like to raise is whether part eight proceedings can become part seven proceedings. This does sometimes happen and it happens if there is a substantial dispute of fact that develops as, as the process uh, evolves. 
Now, Neil is going to talk more about the part seven process. Thanks, Tim. Well, so you've gone through the part eight process and now we move on to part seven. So either you'll be looking to recover the costs of the part eight process, which can be substantial from the advisor who was at fault, or if the part eight process was unsuccessful and you didn't get the relief you required from the court, you'll be uh, claiming for the substantive loss of the scheme through the part seven process, through the professional negligence action. Now, I mentioned uh, elephant traps earlier, and perhaps the biggest elephant trap of all is limitation. There are strict time limits within, you within which you have to make claims. Now, the primary uh, limitation period for a contractual claim is six years from the date of breach. Now, given that it's often years before pension, pension mistakes, errors in documentation come to light, you will often fall outside this primary limitation period. Claimants often try to get around this by saying that it's an ongoing duty on advisors to spot mistakes, but these type of claims or these type of claims generally don't work unless there's a specific task to look at old documentation or mistakes in documentation. So often you're you're falling back on the secondary limitation period, which is three years. Uh, from the date of knowledge required to bring an action. But again, you have to be careful here because it's not just actual knowledge. Uh, it's also the knowledge that you could reasonably expected to have or facts you could reasonably ascertain or facts you could ascertain with the help of an expert. So you have to be careful there too. And also this is all subject to a 15 year long stop on claims, 15 years from date of breach. And the only way of getting round the 15 year long stop is if the, the advisor at fault has deliberately concealed the error. Now, limitation issues are an absolute bars to making a claim. There's no discretion of the court. If you fall outside these time periods, you will not have a claim. The only way of stopping the clock is either to issue a claim form or to enter into what's known as a standstill agreement with the advisors you think are at fault. And typically, you will enter into that standstill, those standstill agreements prior to the part eight action. So when you get to the part seven, you're not time barred. Now, for all part seven claims, you have to undertake what's known as the professional negligence pre-action protocol prior to issuing the claim form. Now, what uh, this effectively means is that prior to issuing the claim form, you have to set out your claim and the losses associated with that claim in as much detail as possible. And the defendant sets out its defence in as much detail as possible before you issue the claim form. So it's very much a cards on the table approach. And this is to promote early settlement of claims and also to make sure that courts aren't too clogged up. Now, this process in itself, the pre-action the pre protocol, can take years and cost uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that's something I'd like to come on to, which is the costs and complexity of pensions litigation. Now, all uh, litigation is expensive. I mean, it costs, for example, £10,000 just to issue a claim form. But pensions litigation seems to be particularly expensive. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, first of all, claims are invariably complex and often document heavy. Secondly, barristers, pensions council, uh, they're relatively few in number and they're incredibly expensive. Um, because of that, they're in demand. There aren't many of them. So fee rates you're looking for, for the most eminent silks are in excess of £1,000 an hour. So very expensive. And also the importance of expert evidence in pensions cases in all part seven and most part eights, uh, you will need expert evidence. Now, this will invariably involve actuarial expert evidence, but also could involve accountancy, covenant type expert evidence as well, and consultancy evidence too. And quantum and actuarial evidence, quantum tends to be a major battleground for pensions claims. And most of you will know that even minor changes in actuarial assumptions can have big effect on numbers. So it pays to have uh, a, a competent actuarial expert on your side in pensions litigation matters. And as with Pensions Council, uh, the number of actuaries with the requisite expertise and experience of dealing with court matters uh, is, is limited. And so therefore the costs tend to be quite high. 
Now, moving on, the majority of part seven actions go to mediation at one stage or another. Sometimes they go to mediation more than once. The court encourages the party to me in parties to mediate. In effect, mediation is compulsory because if you refuse to mediate with the other side, there are swinging cost sanctions. So many claims mediate quite early on, often at a pre-action stage, and it's not a one-off opportunity. You can mediate as many times as you want. What mediation involves is the two parties agreeing on a mediator, agreeing on a time and place for mediation. And at the mediation, the parties will present their cases in summary form, and the mediator will attempt to find common ground between the parties. Now, that doesn't sound as it's likely to promote a successful settlement, but mediations generally, in my experience, are successful, and they will often lead to settlement either at the mediation itself or shortly after. So I think what the mediation tends to do is to focus the parties on the risks of going to trial. And I think also what it does is focus the parties on the costs of actually going to trial. And an important point to remember on pensions litigation is that there is a dearth of court guidance. There haven't been many reported pensions cases, for example, on the scope of actuarial negligence. So if you have a case of this type, you are taking a big risk if you go to court and leave it uh, to the whim of the judge. So mediation is becoming increasingly significant in the resolution of pensions disputes. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Neil Gibson, who's going to take you on a journey through the direction of travel with pensions disputes. Neil, many thanks for uh, that. Um, I'm going to start by talking about some litigation trends. I'll say something briefly about uh, equalisation and then the new wave of cases that we may expect to see. Just starting with the trends, technology is now widely used uh, in part seven litigation. If we wind the clock back to 2011, 2012, we had the Abramovich and Berezovsky trial, where electronic trial bundles were used for the first time. I used the same technology shortly afterwards um, in a major pensions case to good effect. Since then, that technology has been improved and the cost of that technology has come down. We now see electronic trial bundles widely used in major part seven cases. Also, we're seeing technology being deployed by major law firms in an attempt to control cost and to drive efficiencies. The court is also very much embracing technology. Under COVID, the court has been uh, required to uh, respond uh, very quickly. Judges have had to get up to speed with technology and deal with hearings remotely. Also, technology is now widely used in connection with disclosure. Predictive coding software is used in all major Part 7 cases to significantly reduce the cost of a manual review. The reduction in cost is somewhere in the order of 30% by using that technology. If we look at the feedback that is coming from the judiciary, Sir Geoffrey Voss, the next Master of the Rolls, recently made it quite clear uh, that technology post-COVID will play an increasing role. I expect that major trials will be held in person, but I think uh, interlocutory hearings will rely uh, much more on technology uh, than was the case prior to lockdown. Other trends, I think we will see an uptick in claims. Neil alluded to that earlier. 
The stats are not with me on this right now. I mean, if you look at the first four months of the calendar year, uh, new claims issued are down 50% on 2019. However, I expect there to be a significant increase in claims in the final quarter of this calendar year. We are certainly seeing many more cases come down the pipeline and have cases that will be issued probably by Christmas. Most of those claims, unsurprisingly, relate to industries uh, that have been hard hit by COVID, uh, so airlines, hospitality, etc. Other trends. Pre-COVID, data and cyber breaches, we saw a lot of them. I think we are going to continue to see a lot of data and cyber breaches. Trustees and sponsoring employers, I think, can take little comfort from the Supreme Court's decision in Morrison's. That was a case that was largely decided on its facts. I think our clients in the pension space are very much going to have to keep their cyber and data policies and procedures under review. So those are a few of the trends in litigation. Equalisation, a topic that has kept pension lawyers busy for as long as I've been in practice. That's a long time. I think in the prof neg space, equalisation cases are now getting towards the finishing line with limitation having kicked in. However, equalisation has raised its head in other areas. We've recently, back in July, had the Court of Appeals decision in Newton and Safeway. That case confirmed that Section 62 of the Pensions Act is a domestic law measure that closed the barber window with effect from 1 January 1996. We are also seeing GMP equalisation cases still working its way through the system. Finally, looking at the wave of new pension cases that we can expect. I mean, over the last couple of years, we've seen an awful lot of litigation in the RPI, CPI space. And by that, I mean sponsoring employers looking to see if they can move the uprating of pensions from RPI to CPI or CPIH. But we know that CPI or CPIH on average is about 1% lower than RPI. And that is a significant difference in monetary terms. So decisions in cases such as BT, Britvic, Atos, all concern the court being asked uh, whether the uprating of pensions can be moved from RPI to CPI. The answer to that question turns on the construction of the relevant provisions of the trust deed um, and rules. And in the vast majority of cases, the courts have declined to move away from RPI. In the Mitchells and Butler's case, a different approach is being taken. That's a rectification case to see if the trustees are able uh, to use another measure for the uprating of, of pensions. So will we see many more of these cases? I don't know. September last year, the Chancellor announced that sometime between 2025 and 2030, RPI will be calculated in the same way as CPIH. That is going through 
the consultation process. If that shift takes place, it will mean lower increases for pensioners and it will mean lower returns for investors in indexed linked gilts that are pegged to RPI. The value of those assets will fall. In some cases, they will fall very significantly. Given the amounts at stake, investors may want to take a close look at whether they are entitled to compensation. Other cases on the horizon. I think we'll see an increase in the amount of DC plan litigation. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, cases in the DC space over in the US where sponsoring employers and trustees have been sued uh, for breach of fiduciary duty. The allegations essentially being uh, that the DC plans have signed up to inappropriate and expensive fund management services. Claims around investment management and issues involving excessive fees are not straightforward. However, those claims have been shown to be as successful in the United States. And I would anticipate that we will see a number of such claims in this jurisdiction in due course. That was a quick canter through trends, equalization, and what is on the horizon. I'll now hand over to Roxana Pierce. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, CMS, for having me. Today, I would like to discuss a pension fund's options in considering U.S. securities class actions. Pension fund may choose to take an active role as a lead claimant in a class action, or a passive role as a class member, or a pension fund may consider opting out of a securities class action, whether as an individual entity or by joining a group action with other pension funds or institutional investors. I would also like to discuss the impact of a 2010 U.S. Supreme Court decision on non-U.S. securities-related litigation. A typical lawsuit involves all claimants and defendants in a particular case representing themselves and their own interests before a state or federal court. In contrast, a class action involves at least one of the parties, typically the lead claimant, representing a group of people or entities, such as pension funds, who are in a similar situation but absent from the proceeding in order to obtain class-wide relief from a civil wrong that the defendant or defendants have allegedly committed. In 2019, there were 433 securities class actions filed in the United States, mostly by pension funds. The claimant or claimants in a class action are known as the lead, named, or representative claimant or claimants, and they direct the litigation by filing their requisite pleadings, propounding and responding to discovery, sitting for depositions, filing and opposing dispositive motions, moving to certify the class, and ultimately, if successful at class certification, either negotiating a settlement on behalf of the class or participating on behalf of themselves and the absent class members at trial. The class action must be certified by a state or federal court in order to move forward as a class action. This task is implemented through the class certification process. Until class certification takes place, the absent class members are known as putative class members. Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Procedure in the United States is the principal law relating to class actions in U.S. federal courts. Most states have enacted rules similar to Rule 23 that govern class actions in their respective state courts. The class certification process aims to ensure that the absent class members' interests are protected and that the defendant's rights to present their defenses are not compromised. Their specific requirements of a class action are one, that the number of claimants is so numerous that it would be impractical to join all members. Number two, that there is a common question of law or fact among the claimants. 
Number three, that the claims and defenses are typical of the class. And number four, that the class representative adequately protects the interests of the class. However, if a claimant's losses are so large that it does not make sense to stay in a class action as a passive member or as a lead claimant, especially for larger pension funds, then a claimant has the option of opting out of the class and bringing their own action or joining a group action based on the same claim, but the claimant must meet certain deadlines in order to do so. There are other jurisdictional issues for federal and state courts, but I'll stop there on the basics of U.S. securities class actions and opt-out actions and bring your attention to a U.S. Supreme Court decision which mandates the filing of certain claims that could have been filed under the U.S. class action system, but must be filed in non-U.S. jurisdictions, such as Germany. In 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Morrison versus National Australia Bank Limited, federal securities law protection to investors, including pension funds, who engaged in U.S. transactions. The Morrison opinion prompted investors who engaged in non-U.S. transactions to look to the laws of the jurisdiction where the transactions occurred for remedies. More than 40 international group or class securities actions have been filed just so far this year. Therefore, actions similar to class actions and group actions have now been taking shape in many non-U.S. jurisdictions, such as the Netherlands, Germany, Australia, and Japan. Pension funds must have a mechanism to keep track of these cases in order to file timely claims. The class action, group action, and opt-out procedures have streamlined claims and given investors and consumers a stronger voice and the course the efficiency it needs in order to adjudicate duplicate claims. If a pension fund remains a passive class member, then the fund must make sure to file a claim for recovery after the class case is over and a settlement fund is implemented for the benefit of class members. There are strict deadlines for filing for settlement recoveries through a class action claim in the U.S., For non-U.S. claims, the deadlines are different in every country. For example, in Germany, a claim must be filed as the case begins, as outlined under Germany's CAPMUG rules, not after a case ends, as in the U.S. As a pension fund director, advisor, or fiduciary, it's important to keep track of all aspects of class actions and group actions all over the world in order to maximize recoveries for a pension fund and its beneficiaries. As for the cost, of bringing a U.S. class action or an opt-out action, often, probably 90% of the time, those actions are brought on a 100% contingency basis. Thanks very much, Neil. Thanks, Roxana, for that excellent insight into class actions in the U.S. And as I said, perhaps that's a foretaste of what we can expect here in the U.K. in the near future. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to today's lawcast. Uh, I hope it's given you an insight into pensions litigation issues. And as ever, if there's anything you'd like to discuss on any of these matters, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with your usual CMS contact. Mm-hmm.